question of conscience by Catherine Gleason read by Hugh Carr directed by Brendan James of course we must have a revolution Miles Myers gently banged the pub table with his fist for emphasis the ruling classes have us by the throat and look at the mess they've made of our country. But it's changing slowly, isn't it? said Diana, doubtfully. I mean, everybody's got so liberal over the last 20 years or so, compared with... That's just the people in power paying lip service to ideals they ignore. A sop for the gullible and their own consciences. The system's basically the same. All the great social changes have come through violent action. The hunger marches, the suffragettes. We'll all be old before we get a decent form of true socialism, if ever, by conventional means. We need to seize the land, turf out the hidebound traditionalists in Parliament and replace them with people who know what it's all about. Well, making people be socialists sounds a bit arbitrary to me, argued Diana. How can you tell that your sort of government wouldn't be even more repressive than the one we've got now? Like the communist one in Russia, or... Oh, die. You've missed the whole point. With a grimace of mock despair, Miles drained his glass, stood up, and kissed her briefly. Got to go now. My train's due in ten minutes. Don't forget to read the Alexander Berkman. See you Monday she said without enthusiasm. Miles swung out of the pub and made for the railway station across the road. He caught his train easily enough and settled into an empty compartment. After a few moments' hesitation, he unwound the college scarf from around his neck and stuffed it into his overnight bag, then began to read the Politics of Experience, by way of light relief from the tedium of the journey. Miles did not expect his tedium to be much relieved at the end of it either. He was spending the weekend with his Uncle Roland, a recidivist whose ideas and pleasures were rooted in the culture of the 18th century, or so his mother had told him. Uncle Roland had refused to have anything to do with his mother or with Miles until Miles was 21 after the death of Miles' father 12 years ago, saying that he had no time for matrons and brats. Knowing his close handedness, Miles' mother had suspected that Roland Myers was afraid that he would have to help support them financially. If this was the case, he needn't have worried, as Mrs. Myers had managed competently with her salary and the proceeds of her husband's investments. There was also the question of his roistering country squire habits. Miles yawned and set down his book, watching the lush, flat countryside passing by the window as the train ambled on. Perhaps he and his mother had been too conventionally respectable to suit his uncle's tastes. Then, by way of a 21st birthday present, a letter had arrived from Roland Myers saying that he had willed his estate to his nephew in default of other living relatives, and he would like to see what kind of man Myers had become. Pound signs had momentarily lit up in their eyes, and then Miles had recalled his principles and reflected that the country hall would make an excellent hostel for derelicts, or a hippie-style commune, not to mention pop festivals in the summer. He was left with the tiresome problem of pleasing Uncle Roland to secure the estate. Miles entirely disapproved of what he had heard about his uncle. He had no time for 
fascists, as he termed that type of reactionary. They did not believe in the inherent kindliness, the essential compassion, the merciful brotherhood of mankind as he did. Come the revolution, they should all be lined up and shot. On the other hand, Miles reminded himself, he was a pacifist. Strange how evil begot evil, and aggression brought out one's worst instincts. Uneasily, he conceded that Roland Myers was probably widely misunderstood and a victim of society just as much as anybody else. Perhaps he, Miles, could change his uncle's ideas, make him see the light, as it were. Property is robbery, warned his conscience. Don't for goodness sake blow it now, warned his mother. Miles sighed and resumed his book. In a couple of hours, the train idled into a tiny station called Phaeton, but unaccountably pronounced Fane. Miles handed in his ticket and was accosted by a sad little man in an overcoat, which looked too big for him. Mr. Miles, I'm Norton, sir. Mr. Myers sent me to meet you. And the old man touched his cap and made to take Miles's case. It's all right, I'll manage that. It's very heavy. As you wish, sir. Norton's lined face remained impassive, but Miles had the feeling that he was relieved. The car's this way. He led Miles to an ancient Bentley parked at an awkward angle on the narrow lane outside the station. A laughing couple leapt into a sports car behind theirs, reversed noisily and prepared to overtake them. Norton made heavy going of starting the Bentley and selecting first gear while Miles watched the couple enviously. They were due for a brighter weekend than he. As the sports car passed, it whisked against the wing of the big car with a scraping noise. Immediately, Norton switched off the engine and jumped out, waving his arms and shouting at the driver, who waved back with a derisive gesture favored by soldiers and horsemen before accelerating down the lane. A careless young devil, to see what he's done. Mr. Miles will be furious. You saw it, sir, didn't you? It wasn't my fault. Don't get upset, Norton. It's only a scratch. Miles was puzzled by the disproportionate anxiety of the old man's reaction. He looked close to tears, and his hands were shaking with distress. But you'll tell him, won't you, sir? You'll tell him it wasn't my fault. Yes, of course, it's only taking an inch off the paint in any case. Look, would you like me to drive? You're much too agitated. Thank you, sir. I'll be all right. Muttering to himself, Norton climbed back into the car and began a steady crawl towards Fain House. Miles had the weird sensation of leaving behind the 20th century as they rolled ponderously through black iron gates set in a high surrounding wall and over half a mile of driveway to Uncle Roland's home. Miles, my boy, how are you? His uncle was at the front door of his handsome rambling old house to greet him. I expect a glass of sherry would go down rather well after your grueling journey. Especially the last bit, eh? <laughs> Come on in. The latter remarks were shouted over the din of a fearsome barking and howling from somewhere round the side of the house. Miles had not known that his uncle was fond of dogs. He returned the greetings, accepted the offer of sherry gratefully, and was promptly shown inside. A wide, curving staircase stood at the far end of a spacious hall, 
from which half a dozen rooms led off into the depths of the house. Uncle Roland pushed open the door of one of those and ushered his nephew in. This is the drawing room. Now, Sherry. He poured two glasses from a crystal decanter and joined Miles, who was admiring the view from the bay window. Then he set down the drinks and put his hand on Miles's shoulders, turning him towards the light and examining his face carefully. Hmm, you're a Myers, all right. There's a bit of your mother's side. Can't be helped. Well, how was your journey? Miles told him, meanwhile assessing his uncle's appearance. There was certainly a family resemblance. Miles had the same somewhat protuberant eyes and thick lips and the sparse, sandy hair. On the other hand, he emphatically did not have his uncle's huge bulk and coarse, purplish complexion mottled with broken veins. He tried to glaze over the accident with the sports car and the Bentley, but his uncle interrupted. So that old fool Norton managed to get it scratched again, did he? You old fool, he remarked with casual scorn to Norton, who had made an untimely entrance and, on hearing his name mentioned, was hovering nervously near the door. You'll have to go. There was nothing Norton could have done, uncle, protested Miles, beginning to see why the old man was so terrified over the incident. Is that so? Very well, we'll let it pass this time, <laughs> said Uncle Roland with an indulgent laugh. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You're not needing anything at the moment. Right then, sir. Norton closed the door quietly behind him. Miles could never understand how one man could bear to be another's servant, and Norton was so obviously miserable and frightened of his employer. Why doesn't he leave? Miles demanded. Uncle Roland shrugged. He's near retirement age, so who would take him on? Besides, he's been here fifty years. He's the only one who live in, as a matter of fact. The cook and the cleaning woman come in every day from the village, and so does Hodges, who looks after the dogs. Now, if you finish your drink, come and see your room. Most of the house is shut off, you know. Too big for one person, really. Still talking, he walked out of the drawing room and across the hall to the stairs. I expect you're quite lonely here sometimes, said Miles trudging up the steep staircase. I mean, just you and- oh, oh, oh my God! He clutched the banister rail in shock as rounding a bend in the stairs, he saw a face looming close to his. It was only a mirror placed at a dim spot on the curve of the wall so that little light reached it, but the image of the person approaching was rendered gray and ghostly, and Miles's heart skipped rapidly in the couple of seconds it took for his reason to provide the explanation. His uncle roared with laughter. <laughs> it catches everyone like that. <laughs> Had a fellow to stay last month, and he came up in the dark, and <laughs> chap damn near had a heart attack. <laughs> Gritting his teeth into a grin to accompany Uncle Roland's hilarity, Miles followed him up to a small, neat bedroom. In answer to your question, no, I don't get lonely. Plenty of sportsmen hereabouts, and there's a filly down in the village who can be persuaded to accommodate one in various ways. Some quite unusual. His uncle treated him to a man-to-man -man leer, and receiving no response, 
went on briskly. Well, I'll leave you to unpack. Let Norton know if you need anything, and dinner's in about half an hour. Mars was glad to be alone. He fought down a sense of increasing dislike. This man was, after all, a blood relation, though nothing like the mild, kind father he remembered. The conversation over dinner, during which Uncle Roland ate and drank voraciously, did nothing to change his opinion. Roland Myers was reactionary to a degree normally accounted only in students' theories or nightmares. What are you studying at that university of yours? He wanted to know. My course, said Miles importantly, comprises history of politics, ecology, sociology, and law. What? No brain surgery? His uncle clapped his hands to his paunch and laughed uproariously. My, no wonder educational standards have dropped since the war. And what do you intend to do with your smattering of politics, law, and so forth? Hardly a smattering, uncle, replied Miles angrily. It's a four-year course, you know. As long as that, Roland Myers spluttered and then checked himself. Well, well, I'm sure the degree of erudition you'll acquire will be ample for making your way in the kind of society your peers want. Good old Sunday supplement stuff for everyone, including the dustbin, eh? If the economy will stand it. Not at all, retorted Miles heatedly. Our generation doesn't care for material possessions and antiquated conventions. He was about to launch into his celebrated anti-parent speech, including materials drawn from sources as diverse as Lenin and Kerouac, but his uncle stopped him with a wave of his hand. Two things your generation really are capable of, he remarked wearily, wiping his bulbous eyes. A self-deception and chop logic. Now, come outside and see the animals. There's enough light left. The animals turned out to be two fine hunters, which flattened their ears as their master approached, and four savage-looking crossbred greyhounds in a compound adjacent to the stable. All in excellent sporting condition, eh, Hodges? Ah, yes, sir. And the dogs are in fine fettle for tomorrow. Hodges, a small, whining man, gave an oily smile and patted one of the horses. Do you keep them for guard dogs? asked Miles, nodding towards the compound. Well, for coursing, mostly. But we let them loose at night, and I wouldn't like to be the burglar who tries to break into Fane House. What, Hodges? No, I wouldn't. Hodges doubled up briefly with sycophantic laughter. I let them out every night before I go home, and lock them up first thing in the morning, you see, sir, he told Miles. They're bred with a strain of Doberman pincer, see? Killers they are. What if a tramp gets in during the night? Asked Miles, horrified. Or, or a child, or someone from the village? Not much likelihood of that, sir. Do you ride? Asked Uncle Roland, turning abruptly back towards the house. I'm afraid not. Well, never mind. There's some coursing tomorrow afternoon. You can look around the village. Would you like another drink before you turn in? No, thanks. I'm rather tired. Very well. Good night. They parted in unspoken but mutual contempt. The following day was traumatic for a sensitive town-bred Miles. He was woken by a commotion in the yard beneath his window. It was his uncle thrashing one of the hunters. 
Good to remind him who's boss, he said afterwards, by way of explanation. Later that morning in Fane Village, his uncle raised his hand again, perhaps for the same reason, to a cowering girl. He did not actually strike her, because he saw Miles approaching and hastily changed his violent gesture to a paternal pat on the head. But the girl looked abnormally terrified. Run along now, he told her as Miles came closer. Poor thing, she's simple, afraid of her own shadow. This incident disgusted Miles, but he made no comment. They had come down to the village for a pub lunch before the afternoon sport, and his uncle had slipped out while Miles was ordering food. When Uncle Roland had been missing for half an hour, Miles went in search of him and interrupted the episode with the village girl. The filly, presumably. That afternoon was one of the worst he had ever spent. He knew vaguely what coursing hares was all about, but seeing the animals painfully and inevitably killed by swift, savage dogs provoked the same reaction as had his first and last bullfight. He went off on his own, was quietly sick. It was the sight of his uncle's face as much as the slaughter that nauseated him. A light with cruel enjoyment, the red-veined eyes popping from the flushed purplish face, and the fleshy lips open with coarse shouts or slack with sensual excitement. Uncle Roland epitomized everything that was depressing, ugly, and depraved about mankind. The easy sadism, the crass, bloated animalism that rent the precious, thin veneer of civilization. Did you enjoy it? asked Uncle Roland on the way home. My dogs were splendid, don't you think? Splendid dogs, echoed Miles automatically. The secret is to starve them beforehand, you know. Really, said Miles. In the quiet of his room, Miles scolded himself for not having taken his uncle to task over his inhuman behavior for not getting out of this unwholesome environment immediately. But then, he argued, his objections would be unlikely to change his uncle's lifestyle. So why bother? He could not admit to himself that, besides real fear, he felt a kind of horrified fascination for this repulsively brash relative. Over dinner that evening, Uncle Roland asked for a potted version of Miles's convictions. He gave it listlessly, in all its revolutionary glory, while Uncle Roland put away colossal amounts of food and wine. Then I gather you didn't approve of this afternoon's sport? asked his uncle when he had finished. No, I think all life is sacred. And I think, said his uncle, that you young radicals are totally impractical. Chop it down regardless, whatever it is. If it's older than you, that's your philosophy in a nutshell. And what have you got to replace this current system or whatever word is fashionable jargon at the moment? Well, you don't quite know. Result? Chaos. If you ask me, young fellow, he said, pushing back his chair, your kind are the middle class equivalent of soccer thugs and street vandals, mindlessly destructive. Discipline, 
You need self-discipline at the least. Bring back capital punishment as a deterrent and the birch, and half this country's problems would be solved. Why not, thought Miles dully, and thumbscrews, and the rack, and the whole bloodstained caboodle. He said nothing. Well, I'm off now. I'm sure you can amuse yourself better than I can. Spot of cockfighting, I think. And then a visit to my lady friend. Cockfighting's legal, isn't it? Of course, but you can always get to see a bit if you know the right people. I wish you a fond good night. Roland Myers stood up and walked out of the room, and presently Miles heard the front door slam. He sat over the remains of the meal until Norton came to clear away. Thanks for standing up for me over the car, sir. That's okay, Norton. I say... You're not well. The old man was swaying slightly as he reached for the dishes on the table. Oh, I'm all right, sir. Bit of a cold, I think. Norton was shivering and pale, his forehead shiny with sweat. I should go to bed straight away if I were you. I can't, sir. Norton put down the tray he was carrying and rubbed his temples. Mr. Myers has forgotten his keys again. I'll have to wait up to let him in when he gets out of the car. It's the dogs, you see, sir. Could be dangerous if he has to wait about at the front door, like. Well, there's no problem. I'll let him in. The old man's face lit up. Oh, would you, sir? Fact is, I, I took some aspirin and a whiskey, and I, I'm not quite sure I can stay awake. I'd be really grateful. Ah, that's all right. You go to bed, Norton. I'll let him in. And so it was arranged. After Norton's departure, Miles took a bottle of whiskey and a jug of water into the drawing room and settled down to wait for his uncle. Twelve o'clock. One o'clock. Half past one. Miles was halfway down his bottle and the room was beginning to sway slightly by the time the Bentley purred up the drive and its headlights swept the curtains. Miles hurried into the hall. He could hear his uncle crooning some drunken song, slamming the car door, staggering up the front steps, fumbling for his keys. Miles' hand reached for the latch. Lord! Norton, forgot me blasted keys. Hurry up with the door, damn you. Miles withdrew his hand and stood, frowning, considering. He was an idealistically committed activist, wasn't he? His uncle was a cruel, reactionary bore. Why should he, Miles, help to preserve such a creature? Norton! What's the matter with you, man? Open this door immediately! After all, his uncle's death would be no loss to anybody. He was a crass capitalist of the worst kind. Miles rocked a little on his heels, savoring an obscene sense of pleasurable power. Norton! Norton! Let me in! The dogs will be here soon! Norton! Open the door! His uncle's bombastic tone had changed to one of panicky pleading. A sense of perverse excitement reared up somewhere in Miles' mind. Another man's life depended on his whim. He smiled slightly. Oh well, better do the decent thing. Reluctantly, he stretched out his hand to the latch. Again, he paused. The seconds that followed 
with the longest of Miles' life. His emotions were a jumble of conflicting urges and desires. Norton! The dogs! I can see the dogs! For the love of God, man! The words died in a scream of animal terror. It was too late. Miles ran into the drawing room and switched off the light. He hurried to the bay window and lifted the heavy curtain. Outside in the moonlight, his uncle was running for his life towards the stable, and after him loped two lithe, sinister forms, moving with an easy grace, as if some instinct told them that for this prey, there was no escape. Miles watched breathlessly as the ravening hounds fastened onto the staggering form of Roland Myers, pulling him screaming to the ground and tore into the twitching body with all the viciousness their master had cultivated so carefully. Miles saw the kill to the end, only turning away when the dogs developed a savage, tugging game with the corpse. His palms were damp with excitement, and he was breathing heavily. The snarling, rending sound still ringing in his ears, he quietly crossed the hall to the stairs. His hall. His stairs. It was all his property now. It was my fault entirely, officer, he mentally rehearsed. Norton wasn't feeling well and I told him to go to bed and I would wait up and let my uncle in. I'm afraid I fell asleep. No, I didn't hear anything. Yes, it is a dreadful thing. I can hardly believe it. But I did tell him, you know wasn't wise to let the dogs roam loose at night. He smiled to himself as he began to climb the stairs. The story was foolproof, surely. Then, in the half-light came an unspeakable shock. A ghastly face suddenly loomed before him, a familiar bloated face with gloating, distended eyes, full of animal satisfaction, the thick, loose lips still smirking in sadistic excitement. Choking back a scream, Miles clung to the banister, his head spinning and his heart laboring in a state of nauseated, paralyzed terror. It took him some minutes to recognize his reflection in the mirror. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Press the notification bell to be up to date with every new story. And as always, look out for the monsters.